Gig Gab, the Working Musicians Podcast, episode 143 for Monday, December 4th. Happy birthday, kiddos, 2017. <laughs> Greetings, folks, and welcome to Gig Gab, the podcast by for and about working musicians here as usual, not always, but usual in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamill. Here, here as always in Las Gatas, California, as always, as always, to Paul Kent. How you doing, Mr. Kent? Pretty good, man. We've got this uh, couple of weeks of Christmas. You know, the world is swirling in a lot of different ways. How's your life? Uh, life's been crazy uh, the last couple of weeks, but it's, but you know, manageable. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Manageable is good. You got a a little time for music? Yeah, a little bit. I played, uh, I played with Amanda last, I want to say Thursday night. And I think I'm correct in that. We did a gig at a kind of a local watering hole here. And what do you uh, call that act when you play just with you and Amanda? Uh, she generally just calls it either, you know, Amanda Dane or the Amanda Dane band is, is how that gets booked. And you're the band. Uh, no, there's sometimes there's, there's, there's been three of us. We've done many gigs with a bass player and many gigs without me that she's done with this guy who plays bass. So, yeah. And is it based upon what the client wants or, you know, like I want, I want you, I want a duo, I want a trio. Yeah. And that's it, how she, yeah. It, it's usually, so, um, most of her bookings actually come through. Uh, Paul Costley, who is the oh yeah 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 the booking agent that we had on the show here, and I actually synced the two of them up last year, and that's frankly where most of her work now comes from. Not all of it, but but he he keeps her pretty busy. And as Paul was telling us on the show, he generally books you know acoustic stuff. He's gotten out of booking full bands, and so it's mm. it's uh, solos, duos, and sometimes trios he'll book. But the money that he gets for for duos is is generally actually the money he gets for everybody. I should say it, you know, for solos, duos and, and trios is, is quite a bit above what I would call the, you know, minimum market rate. So even what he gets for a duo sometimes, you know, if she feels like, well, I want to have, you know, uh, two other people with me, she can afford to, to, to do that with the money that's, that's on cool. the table. Yeah, it's good. You know, we had, we had a conversation going on, on our Facebook community page about, market rates and you know one of the one of the readers posters he was talking about you know trying to establish a minimum mm. and my response was well you, you can establish a minimum if you have the leverage to enforce the minimum i mean you, you know you it's can all about you, leverage you, yeah you know whatever number you want you can do and and you know that's you that can be whether you decide to leave the house or not but i don't know that so much a cover band with an average following or below is going to be able to affect really market rates for what people are going to get paid. So are, are you, are you cool if I ask you what the, the, what, what's good pay for a trio where you are? Um, I mean, generally for an acoustic trio, you know, 300 bucks would be a, a good rate. Right. And a hundred bucks a man, hundred bucks a man. Yep. And that's what, uh, that's what she'll get for a duo through costly. Oh. Is, is that? Yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, it's not like tons of extra money, but it's more and, and a trio often will get like 500 through costly. Yeah. It kind of seems like I'm going to be broadly general because I watched that thread that we had on the community yeah. page. Yeah. It seems like a hundred bucks a man is, is the average of, of basic respectability below that it's, it's bad pay. I, I would agree with that. Although, unless it's an unusually good tipping environment. Yeah, well, and, and Amanda's great at working that scene, regardless of what the base pay is. She, you know, it's not rare for us to double our income with tips. Oh. Yeah. Is, is she full time? Is this all she does? Um, no, she's got a, she's got a, this is like, well, no, but this is her priority. So yeah. she has like a, a, a day gig doing retail somewhere. And, uh, but, but she'll move that around in order to do gigs. And then, and then she's in the theater world too. So got it. Yeah. yeah. yeah so, a I, I, hundred bucks a man seems to be nationally about the minimum for a, for a working musician to get out of bed. And, um, I think so. I sh- I should ask, is good. Yeah. I should ask my friends in Austin. Cause when I was down yeah. there, 
it was 50 bucks a man it was sort oh, of, the, wow. yeah, it was just the, I mean, that's just what it was. And then as soon as I moved from there uh, to Connecticut, it was, you know, back up to that hundred bucks a man. So, and it was a hundred a man in Connecticut before I left, like that rate hasn't changed in decades. And, uh, so sad. It's, well, it's a function of the drinking age being raised, right? I yep. think when you went from 18 to 21, it changed the whole dynamic of that. Uh, well, that's that's the rate. But then there's also the dynamic of the amount of venues that are offering yeah. you know, yeah. mu- music. So, you know, it's, it's true. It's an imploding ex- equation, right? It's, yep. it's not it's not stacked for growth is, is yep. to be to be humble about it. Yeah. So I'd be curious <laughs> what what it is in Austin. I'll find out. I'll yeah. Ask somebody. Yeah. 50 bucks, man. Yeah. Yeah. That's what wow. it was. Yeah. I mean, the cost of living down there is less than it is. Well, certainly less than it was for me in Connecticut, less than it is for you out there. Uh, compared to here, eh, probably still a little bit less cost of living in Texas. I mean, Austin's the most expensive city in Texas, but it, it, it's less, you know, than yeah. most other places. But even at that, you know, 50 bucks, a man, it's, it's any yeah. gig is going to be roughly five hours of your time. Correct. You know, right. So 10 bucks an hour. 10 bucks an hour. No. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, exactly. It, it brings to mind, I, I saw a really great show last night. There's a, uh, a club in Santa Cruz, California called Moe's Alley. Um, it's about a 300 person club and it, it brings in around the types of acts, touring acts that are kind of about 300 people. So a little bit like the English beat plays there. They do a great blues series. So they have like, I don't know if you know, Tommy Castro, Coco Montoya, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, like yeah, really yeah. like good Nasty blues. habits, right? That was his. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. Right. yeah. Yeah. And, uh, so I saw a show last night. A friend of mine took me uh, to see this artist, Willie K. It, it's, it's interesting on so many levels. So Willie K is a legend in Hawaii. Okay. You can see him almost any night of the week in Hawaii somewhere, including, you know, Tuesday nights, he does a duo at a golf course, you know, once a month on a, on a Wednesday night, you know, he may have his full blues band out. Uh, you know, a lot of the celebrities that own, or live in Hawaii, sit in with him or invite him to sit in. And he, you know, he, he works all the time. He's a true, you know, journeyman musician. He has many original albums out and, uh, and he's created a home in Santa Cruz. I don't know whether he's just worked the market and he's created it, but he typically sells out this 300 seat venue. Yeah. Great show. And and the guy is an amazing talent. I mean, I mean, he did, it, it was ostensibly a blues show that, w- that we went to see, but he did, he did a side of Tommy. He did some Fleetwood Mac. He's got his beautiful voice, growls out the blues, sang some opera. You know, it was really remarkable and really a fun, wide ranging thing. He's total virtuoso guitarist, flamenco, flat key, blues, rock. I mean, really a great player. Huh. Like I said, he comes here. It's kind of cool. He's up on stage. It's a small club. I mean, we're, we're not you know saying that this is you know twenty thousand people or anything like that. But yeah, a, right. a true artist. And then again, if you go to Hawaii, if you vacation in Maui, you can catch this guy on a Tuesday night doing a duo. And uh, you know, he's a working musician. He's right. put out several original albums. And I was just wondering because you again, you always have more of an optic into original music and and uh, and the path to life there so given what i described again you know he's, he's working acoustic duos on tuesday he's you know bigger shows when he can small tours when he can and he actually made a really lovely comment last night he goes you know i lived in san francisco many years ago 25 bucks a week you know for a regular gig that i had you know back in the must have been in the early 70s. He goes, you know, I know a lot of people in this audience are, are musicians. Hats off and love to you for trying to keep it alive because it is just not an easy thing to do. And then you look at his calendar and you see how hard that cat works. Yeah. You know, what do you what do you think a a, a, a musician? So again, this is not a cover band guy. This is a semi original guy with a somewhat of a following, you know, 50 to 70 grand a year. He could hope to make over 100 grand a year. Under 50 grand. I know the guys in my band who are full-time musicians. Yep. And again, we've had this discussion. They, it, it wasn't a choice to them. They're a musician. That's who, that's what they're going to be. Sure. And they craft out a life by teaching. And that, that is the, like, if you're going to be a full-time musician, but, and I, we've had somebody on the show who, who put this into perspective and said it much more eloquently than I, but it was something along the lines of, if you want to be a full-time musician, stop and think about all the other things that you could do as a career and if nothing else comes to mind, then mm. you know that you're meant to be a musician. But if literally anything else appeals to you, do that instead. Yep. That's the advice they have. Now, I mean, you know, 
That, yeah. So it's just a perspective. Have you, yeah. ha, has it ever crossed your mind and have you ever run the, run the numbers about how you could do it for yourself? Hmm. Yeah, but it, it, it has, uh, it would include doing something like what, you know, what Paul Costley has done, right? Where it's like, okay, if I'm going to go all in on this, it means I need to have relationships with, you know, people that book music in many different places. And there's no reason to have those relationships just for me. Right. If I'm going to have that relationship, I'm going to leverage it up and I want to have a hundred musicians so that I can get all the money. <laughs> get a piece from of that. Yeah. yeah. I want to get a, I want to get a juice on, on this action. Yeah. So, right. I mean, but that's just, that's just the way my, my brain works. Um, uh, and it's not, you know, they say drummers think this way. It, it's not surprising that Paul's also a drummer. Right. But um, so I've thought about that and I've done the math on what Paul makes. I, I haven't asked him specifically, but I've done the math on that and it's somewhere between 80 and a hundred grand a year. Uh, so, but that's uh, not just from playing. In fact, most of it is not from playing. Got it. Yeah. But for somebody like Willie K, I'm looking at his website, right? He's got one, two, three, four, five, five people that, that, work for him in various capacities on his contact page. I, they're not all full timers. Right? And, right. and and then maybe another PR firm. It's hard to tell. So maybe six. Uh, so there's got to be a little bit of money on the table there to keep those five or six people paying attention to him, even though they're paying attention to other people as well. Right. I mean, if you know, a manager doesn't just manage one artist generally, especially not right. at this level. But you figure he's got to be grossing six figures in order for this to even make sense, right? To have somebody in charge of his merch, to have somebody in charge of like being a booking agent. He's got somebody listed. He's got a woman named Debbie listed as a booking agent and then Carrie listed as manager. So that's, I mean, like that's a luxury to have. Yeah. Right. You, you know what I'm saying? So there's got to be. It's got to be, a, you know, somewhere between one and three hundred grand on the table every year. Mm. I maybe and maybe maybe closer to the lower end of that, but maybe one to one fifty minimum to make this work. I I know people who live in Hawaii. It's not a cheap place to live. Yeah. So that's what I'm thinking. Do you know? The, do you know the answer? Or not? I don't know the answer. Okay. I, I and I'm fascinated by all of it. You know, I'm yeah. I'm, I'm fascinated by. When a touring band, like, so we have a, a really nice uh, venue here called the Mountain Winery. And that's where, and, you know, they, it's an outdoor, I think it's about 2,000, I think it's about 2,000 seats. And so, you know, Paul and Oates will play there in, in the summertime, right? Yeah. Bel- pretty much from as long as the weather's good, May until October, they'll have, they'll have music. How much does a, how much does a side man for a pro, for a pro band get, uh, you know, it, well, it, it's a weekly salary is how that goes. Well, and it's not always right. It, it, it could be per gig. It, it depends oh, on the true. Oh, right? Yeah. 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 But yeah for, tour, for a touring act, it's weekly salary during the tour, whether or not you're paid a retainer when you're not on tour. Uh, you know, that depends on the relationship. But like like, you know, yeah. when we talked to uh, Kenny Aronoff, it he didn't say it outright, but it I interpreted it that he his Fogarty gig was something for which he was paid a retainer. And so those gigs always came first. And he talked about how he had to juggle that. Right. So I assume either there's just, you know, enough money per gig on the table where it's like, yeah, I'll do those. Or he's being paid a retainer or some there's some relationship, uh, you know, that defines his availability there. Yeah. I only have two points of reference for this. You know, my one friend is a pro sound guy. Yeah. Is on it was on retainer. So even if he took other gigs, when when the retainee called him, he had to drop what he was doing and go, and that's part of the deal. Uh-huh. And then a friend, uh, a friend of a friend, a friend of Nick's actually, who was uh, he had a short stint as a bass player recently. Well, recently, maybe you know within the last ten years for the Black Crows. Yeah. And the same thing, he was on a retainer basis. So you know, I guess that's that's a business model for how bands are like. You know, when when we want to go, we don't want to have to you know put together a band. We want to have guys on the, on the wait for us. That makes sense. Yeah. So, well, and interesting. I, I, and again, I have to say without saying it, I'm sad that it, that uh, your pro sound buddy is no longer on retainer. So <laughs> I'm just going to say that. If he's out there listening, he, he knows exactly what you mean. Yeah. 
Yeah. So, um, yeah, anyway, net, net. So Willie K was awesome. What an amazing talent he played. You know, like I said, he did some who he did some cream. He did some CB wonder. He did a ton of his own stuff, covering a whole bunch of genres, played slack key guitar. He played flamenco guitar. He played great blues guitar, great blues guitar, played ukulele. I mean, just, this was a, this is a world talent, you know, really, really accomplished musician. And, you know, you look at his life and he's playing, a, he's playing a golf course on Monday nights and, and, and very humble about it, you know, yeah. very like, you know, grateful to be able to come and play his music outside of his local area. And he cobbles a living and, you know, in a way, you know, there's a little bit of a, there's a little bit of a romance to thinking about having a life like that, you know, when you don't have a life. And I, again, maybe that's what you said is probably the most important thing here to sit here as someone thinking about, I'd rather do that instead of my day job is kind of a, a fantasy environment in your head. Yeah, you, you have the only way you're allowed to say that. And I, I mean, of course this isn't, <laughs> this isn't true. We've seen people go from one career to the other and be very successful right. at it. But y- you know, the, the, uh, so I'll finish my thought as I started it. The only way you're allowed to say that is to re rewind and erase your entire career doing anything else and yep. just starve as a musician for however long it, took took or takes to get to the point where you can you know live comfortably whatever that means yeah we should circle back around with that cat um, matt gibson who we had on mm, right yeah. when we started everything because he kind of he kind of is like the 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 patron saint for musicians who want to figure out how to, how to build a life for them like he has yeah. all these business models and we should probably get him on again and talk about it again because yeah. again you know you're right it's it's a fantasy for for a guy who's had a day job to sit here and go oh wouldn't it be nice and but it, the guys who do it are the ones who it was never a choice for them that was going to be their life. Well, and, and, I will uh, tell you as someone who spent you know so uh, I, when I when I was on the road with the Clambake I was sort of in between phases of my life. That's really the only thing that allowed me to just you know walk away and not come home for months at a time. Uh, <laughs> I had I had. Uh, Worked at uh, various places, including Citibank, for a long time, both as an employee or employee, and then as a consultant. Um, and then just decided I needed to to move, and that's when Lisa and I moved from at that point Connecticut down to Austin. And we hadn't been in Austin for a month when I found well, actually Lisa found this you know this gig to go on the road with the Clambake, and and so I had the ability to just go out and put my life on hold because it was already sort of on hold. I did in the meantime, basically between when I got the gig and when I went on the road, there was about a four month gap. I wound up syncing up with, uh, with a company called computer nerds that was doing like, uh, like geek squad stuff. They were going to people's houses and and we Uh did that for a long time. And so I had gotten involved with that and the, the owner of the business and I were like, oh, we hit it off and like, OK, yeah, we should work together on this. But hey, man, I'm going away on the road. And he's like, that's fine. You know, let's sync up when you get back, which we did. And, and things actually did very well um, for us both. But my life was on hold while I was on the road. And I, I, you know, I hadn't I didn't have any money and really not any time invested in nerds. And the things that I did have time invested in, I had sort of already walked away from moving, you know, 2000 miles away. So I had the opportunity to just go with this life of being on the road with this band past that one tour. There was a lot of talk about, wow, this is a good lineup for this band. We should continue together. And there was like. I liked the romantic side of that. I mean, I loved playing the gigs every night, but, but there was a huge part of me that was like, no way I can't do this. Mm. Uh, even though I really wanted to like, like, I mean, it was, it was definitely a, a, you know, an internal struggle that went on. Couldn't do it because you knew there was a better way to making a living. Correct. It was yeah. like, Oh man, you know, I got my life on hold and it was, I mean, it, you know, I gave myself the excuses like, well, I can't deal with this band leader, you know, when I have this other life on hold. And, but if I didn't have this other life on hold, I absolutely could have dealt with this band leader. You know, he wasn't yeah. like a monster, but we all have like quirks about our personality. When you live with somebody, you really learn those quirks. So <laughs> I, you know, I, I created a narrative for myself that was like, yeah, I can't stay with this. I, you know, I have to go back to, to, you know, this isn't going to work for me. It's going to drive me crazy or whatever, but it was only because I had another option. 
uh, you know, I knew of another, I knew I could create this other option for myself. It wasn't even that somebody was like standing there with money. It was like, I got to go back and like make this business happen. But, but even with that, it was, I'm going to go do that instead. And then of course, you know, the day after you get home, you're like, crap, I want to get out on the road again. Yeah. Yeah. That's the problem. And so there's, you know, my life in a nutshell for the last, you know, 25 years. (laughs) (laughs) Do you know who Roger McNamee is? Roger McNamee. Why does that name sound familiar? So Roger McNamee is, is a very famous venture capitalist. Okay. Okay. He also, uh, you know, after some amount of success, clearly pursued a passion of his and he's put together, he's put together a few bands. Yep. First one was called the flying other brothers. And the next one was called moon Alice and moon Alice is a jam band style band. And, you know, I, and I'm only sharing this story because kind of the other end of the spectrum, this is a guy who went out and created incredible success for himself in a day job and uh, then, then pursued his passion. And, you know, I don't know a whole lot about moon Alice. I mean, a good band, um, uh, but they, they, I imagine he, he financed because they tour and you know, they put out self, self-produced oh, yeah. albums. Yeah. And, and again, Roger is like, not, not a little su- successful. He's insanely successful. Right. Got it. And a really smart guy, very passionate guy, uh, interesting fellow. But again, that, that would be the other end of it is like, yep. you know, to, to, to evaluate a life in music because you're fed up with a life and day jobs is probably a challenging position to enter, right? Yes. Uh, you know, I don't, I don't know many people in their 30s, 40s, certainly 50s, who can easily make that transition if you still need to provide for a family, pay pay a mortgage, that type of stuff. Sure. But the concept is a bunch of guys who, you know, okay. have yeah. made their money, right? And yeah. and uh, and now want to put it into, I mean, and that's kind of interesting because I, you know, I see, you know, them as a, like, a, they open for some some touring bands for a while and, they get some interesting gigs and, uh, you know, having a, a venture capital, yeah. uh, <laughs> stocked, you know, mini bar type of thing. And, and, uh, yeah. you know, so that, that would be the other end of it. Yeah. But, well, that's, I mean, that's like Jethro Tull, right? Ian Anderson made all of his money in, like running fish hatcheries or something. Really? Yeah. I didn't know this. Yeah. The music thing was just like a side project, I think, at least for a little mm-hmm. while. I don't know which one, you know, what, what actually has made him more, but, uh, but yeah, 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 yeah. That was that was kind of the That's interesting funny. story about him. Then there's Sammy Hagar, which is the other direction, right? Which is you know he took some yep. of the money that he made from rock and roll and invested and, that into tequila companies and rum companies now and, made and bars and yeah, billions. yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but but even with him, right? He said, "Look, I don't need to worry about like taking a gig with Van Halen to pay the bills." He said, "I can go out on the road with Chickenfoot or with whatever uh-huh. outfit I want, and I do it because I love it." And now he's really good at that job. Like it's not, you know, to tr- to to think of music as a side job for Sammy Hagar is sort of an interesting concept. Because, <laughs> well, because he's such a such a great frontman. Uh, if you've never seen him live. Go run next time he's he's near you. Go see him live. He's just he 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 will make you feel and I and it doesn't matter that I'm telling you this ahead of time. He will make you feel like this is the best show he's ever played. Absolutely. The best crowd. He he just has a way of doing it, even when you expect it. It's really something. Yeah. Well, we had Robert Berry on the show before. Remember, Robert was right. Sammy's bass for a right. while and uh yeah. I think he said kind of the same things is that, you know, Sammy knows what he's doing and he's, he was, he was born to do what he does. He was born to do this. Yeah. Without question. Yeah. 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 Well, cool. So anyway, uh, summary, you know, check out Willie K. If you're, if you're evaluating a life in music, think about, think about what he does. And I, I would, I would again emphasize the cat is crazy talented, like a very great entertainer and crazy talented. And this is about his entry point, you know, yeah. he, you know, he, He's big man on campus in 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 Hawaii. He, he has some following outside of Hawaii, and and uh, and uh, you know he has a life in music. You know, he seems happy. I'll say that. That's good. Well, yeah, and I mean that's part of it, right? If if this is the thing that you have to do, then above a, a certain minimum amount to sustain your life, you know, big money doesn't matter as much. You you just like. If you're if you're happy playing gigs, then and you can do that all the time and afford to live, then yeah. there you go. Yeah. Yeah. 
So the next thing I want to talk about was um, I've been thinking a lot about about my path as a vocalist and, you know, the kind of the semi-professional path, you know, to being a, a singer, you know, and, okay. and the, the structural things. And I, I'll start this. Being a singer is singing is a lot like being a golf player. Some people walk up to the ball and hit it a mile straight and it's just a natural talent and they're just awesome at it. Right. Mm -hmm. Some people, I guess I've only golfed once in my life. So, well, and some people have to take a lot of lessons in order to be able to, you know, keep it on the course. Yeah. Singing is very similar. And when I started singing for my band, one of the reasons I became a singer is because I couldn't find when I decided to get back into music, I couldn't find someone to lead a band the way I wanted it to be led, you know, kind of the yeah. vibe and tone. And so I was like, All right. and, I, and I tried and just didn't find someone. And so I took it on. I was wholly unprepared at the time to do it. And I'm going to say something that I think probably carries for a lot of the people. I thought um, passion and enthusiasm would be enough to carry the day singing rock and roll. And, and that and got it, me. It can be. No, it can't be. Well, it can't be. <laughs> no, there are plenty of bands out there that have proven that it can be, unfortunately. <laughs> well, and that's kind of why I wanted to have this conversation, yeah. because for, for anybody who's on their path as a vocalist in whatever way it may be, and again, I'm astounded at the level of natural talent that I see in, in vocalists, you know, untrained. Yeah. You know, even, even, you know, I've spent a lot of time in lessons, bad mechanics that, you know, will probably come back and hurt somebody somewhere along the line. But the amount of, the amount of beautiful tone that I hear is really humbling. I mean, there's a lot of really wonderful singers out there and people who are born with that skill and innately connect to it as a way of expressing themselves. It's really an amazing thing to me. To me, it's been much more a, a, a blue collar path, you know, rolling up my sleeve, blood and guts, blood, sweat and tears. You know, it's been, it's, been, it's a lot of effort. Yeah. And my reflection on, on this is the most important thing a singer can do is a, a semi-professional, an amateur singer who wants to sing is to have an innate focus on pitch. Uh, I was just going to say that pitch to, is the most important thing to me. Pitch is the most important thing. You you can have uh, not great tone, but if you can sing in tune, it will go at best unnoticed, right? Like it will be functional. And that that's a, that's actually not a bad starting point. Uh, if you've got great tone and awful pitch, that that's not going to sell it. You right. got to be able to sing in tune for most tunes. I mean, if we're if we're going to, but if we're going to start start and talk start talking about like the Ramones or you know you're covering Iggy Pop stuff or whatever, like there's a there's a whole genre of music where where I'm not saying those guys didn't have good pitch. Most of them actually did, but in terms of covering that stuff, you don't really need it. Um, you can get, a, or you can get away with it without it. It's still in pitch. Yeah. I mean, I know. It's, it's kind of monotone, but it's still in yeah. pitch. Yeah. I know. I know you've got it, but you, in order to cover that stuff, yeah, you've got to have, um, uh, in order to cover most things, you've got to have good pitch. And if you pitch. don't, it's it like, it's a non-starter. And yeah. you know what I've, what I've been reflecting on lately is, it's not fun to look at yourself in the mirror. You know, it, you, <sighs> we all are amazing rationalizers, right? You, yeah. you try to find, man, I hit that note really good, you know, ignoring the other section of the song that you didn't hit that well. <laughs> and so, and so I, the advice that I have, uh, you know, the wisdom I would impart is, is really develop that skill to be really hard on yourself, record yourself, be very frank about the parts of songs or the, the songs that you're selecting in general. You know, there, I, I definitely have been guilty about this often picking songs that, you know, not my range, not the right key for me, your willingness to change a key to, to rework phrases of songs. If you literally can't do it, there's yep. so much about the mechanics of vocals that are, you know, some of it, you know, it, it's all about uh, tone and pitch on different volumes and consonants. Right. And you're, everybody's made a little bit differently. And yep. some, again, some people just walk up to the ball and hit it straight down the fairway. And, and you know, that it's just natural to them. Tone resonates in their, in their head, you know, correctly. If you are not that guy, I just want to say, you know, I had someone ask me, how do you learn to sing? And, and, and it was like, well, A, you got to get really comfortable with you sa sounding like you. Yeah. In your you're mind, hear you start. Yeah, that's right. Well, well, not only that. So for the first part of that is 
when we start as a cover band performer, you know, a lot of times you want to sound like your idols and oh, you kind of go yeah. for that. Yeah. Do you, you're, you're probably not, you sound like you and getting comfortable with you sounding like you is the basis of discovering your voice. I think, you know, picking material that works for you to sound like you oh, and, and actually relative to what you just said, remember, and what you hear of yourself is what you're hearing through bone in your head, as opposed to what's going out into the air, which is a you know yeah, fairly when, different thing. And when things come back in a monitor, it's going to sound different than you think you sound. And yeah. you just and it, get used to that. That's all. Yeah. And, and yeah, so you connect all those dots. Not only do you have to get used to that and accept it for what it is. <laughs> yeah. But if you keep trying to sound like somebody else and imitate somebody else and you don't have the, if you don't have the physics or the, you know, the, the, the body and, and you know, ability to actually mimic, um, you know, you have to, you have to be who you are in order yeah. to be successful singing. Yeah. Some, but I, some again, people out there have the ability though, like Johnny D who sings in, uh, in chafed and monkey fist with me. He, he has the ability to sound like whoever sang the song. I mean, he, it still sounds like him, but, but just his natural way of learning tunes he has the ability to resonate like many different people. And it's, it's quite something he's almost it, but it, but it's, he's like a savant about it. Like he doesn't, <laughs> he, he just channels he, it. He just, yeah. He's like, well, I just learned the tune and I sing it. He's like, but I couldn't sing the harmony part. He's like, that would screw me up. Like, don't ask me to do that, man. Like, you know, <laughs> but, and he's actually better at, at finding harmonies than he thinks he is. But but it's because he's had, uh, I don't think he's had any training. Uh, he might've had some, but I don't think so. I think he just, you know, he just sings. He's like that person that hits the ball down the fairway. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But, he, but you know, even to your point, that is great, but he, you know, he can walk straight down the fairway. When you do ask him to sing harmonies, he's very uncomfortable. Like he doesn't, he's better at it than he thinks he is but he is not confident with it and he doesn't hear all the harmonies so that he knows where to go or what to listen for or what not to be distracted by i mean there's there's and of course he could he he would just have to you know learn yeah. and yeah. and so there is that development of it uh regardless of what sort of what level of natural uh, facility and ability you come in with yeah yeah so may, maybe i should just modify to say if you, if be comfortable with your own voice, understand your abilities to mimic the people that you want to get to. But I, I would actually summarize this by saying that that path to be becoming a proficient vocalist has to do with discovering your own voice. And like I said, a, a rigorous demand on pitch. I mean, yeah, you're like you said, you can get away with a lot of ills. If you're on pitch, you yeah. cannot get away with a lot of ills if you're off pitch. I mean, musicians will not want to play with you. The audience won't. They'll just know it doesn't sound right. You yeah. know, they, and, you know, you, you won't be you won't be doing something that will garner you an audience. You know, it just won't sound right and it won't connect with people and you won't you know get the expression across. And but I will say this, the the the. Um, the path to discovering your own voice. Once you understand what the game is again, again, if you start with it, I, I don't think I'm unique. A lot of people who want to sing, they want to express and they want to connect with people through music. And so passion and enthusiasm uh, are, are your basic tools when you get started. Oh, you, well, you um, need that. Yeah. You need bullheaded persistence. Well, you need, yeah. You, well, and you, and actually enthusiasm will get you, you know, confidence will get you a long way in many endeavors in life. Certainly singing, singing confidently is part of the deal. If you, if you look like you're apologizing when you're singing, you're probably not going to go over <laughs> as well, even if you're in pitch. It doesn't you matter if not. you sound good, right? You need yeah. to, yeah. The, the audience needs to feel comfortable watching you. And therefore you need to, appear as though you feel comfortable doing whatever it is you're doing. Fake it exactly. till you make it. Yeah. 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 So, and, and that's, that's fair. Fake it, but know what your path you're on. So fake yeah. it till you make it, but understand that that's not, you can't only fake it. Right. You know, the goal, the well, goal is to make. you can fake confidence if, if, you know, to some level. You can't fake pitch. You can't fake pitch. No, I, um, you know, I always enjoyed singing. Um, I never really understood pitch properly i mean i you know my mother uh, plays guitar and sings and so i i mean i always knew what being out of tune was obviously and uh, maybe not obviously because it's not for everyone but for me it certainly was but i i just didn't understand how it all worked even though i was, had taken piano lessons for years and you know all of that and then when i got to college uh 
I took some, uh, had to take some sight singing classes or I took some harmony and theory classes, which included sight singing labs, uh, I think three days a week. And these labs would be, you know, me and a group of 20 people or so. And we would just be singing intervals all, you know, all classes. <laughs> this would be an hour straight. And it was, I mean, it was awful. Uh, gosh. And most, for some reason, I always wound up with 8 a.m. sight singing labs, like <laughs> on the other side of campus. So, you, you know, I had to wake up and early and walk over. And so I think that's actually where I developed my strength in my falsetto because most of these intervals at 8 a.m. I couldn't sing full voice. I wasn't warmed up. You know, I just right. walked in. So I was singing falsetto, a lot of them, which our teacher encouraged. He's like, it doesn't matter. You don't worry about your tone. Don't worry about anything. This is not a singing class. This is a, a harmony class. So you just mm. need to be able to, to reproduce this. And, uh, and that really like simultaneous with that, I was also playing in a relatively popular uh, rock band that played around a, a lot on campus, uh, that original band that was in called Go, Go Figure. And so that, you know, doing those two things simultaneously, like getting these tools and then going out and I was singing in this band, uh, harmonies anyway. And so, you know, that was that was the place where I could go and like test this stuff out and be like, oh, hey. And they'd be like, wow, you're getting better. It's like, well, you know, it's funny. You focus on something and actually mm. improves, you know. So um, but that's the, that's sort of the point I'm I'm trying to get across here is you just have to start paying attention to it and and doing it. And there's iPhone apps that you can find to do pitch training and all of that stuff. And that I, I guarantee you will help you with your singing. It'll help you with every aspect of music that you do because you'll start yeah, being agree. able to hear chords and how things relate to each other and all of that, which is just freaking awesome. But in terms of singing, yes, it will help. Just doing the ear training stuff and having to sing intervals and that sort of thing, it you'll, you'll learn how to be in tune. Yeah, just, It I, just I, happens. I, I would also say lessons are a really good thing. Finding a good teacher because there's a whole bunch of Going back to this golf analogy, some people just walk up, they swing straight, they hit straight. Many people don't. And mm -hmm. in order to correct that, you have to understand mechanics. You have to understand how your body makes sound, how you control the sound, how you focus the sound, you know, how you, you know, take this. I think I told you that I had this great voice teacher who said it's all about the buzz that 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 vibration that you make that starts in your diaphragm comes up, you know, through your body, you know, goes out through your head somewhere is a buzz and the whole thing of singing is, is what you're going to do with that buzz, hmm. how high it's going to be, how low it's going to be, you know, how, how much air pressure you're going to create to, to enact the buzz. So mechanics are a very real thing when learning that's to a, sing. That's again, an interesting, it's sort of it's an interesting way to teach that it's not wrong. I mean, it's not the only way, but that it's, um, I never, you've, you've mentioned it before, but this is the first time you've really, you, it's the first time you've explained it in a way that made me understand what you were saying. You know, yeah. you, you referred to the buzz, uh, but now I get it. Yeah. That's interesting. I had, um, I had a really interesting path because I learned pitch long before I ever took a singing lesson. Um, like I said, I learned pitch in college when we were, mm -hmm. you know, doing this, but I didn't take any singing lessons until I guess about 10 years ago, I wound up getting Bell's palsy and after I Bell's palsy, for those of you that don't know, uh, results in half of your face and half of your throat uh, being completely paralyzed for uh, several weeks to months. Most people recover 100 percent. I did not. I, but I but I recovered like 95 percent, which is totally fine. Mm -hmm. uh, but that 5 percent that I'm lacking is muscle control all throughout the right side of my my face and neck. Because the trigeminal nerve is is what what gets paralyzed and then what comes back. So I had to learn how to sing again, or I chose to learn how to sing with this with a throat that was not working in parallel, right? Because one side of my throat has has muscles that can do different things than the other side. And I took just a couple of singing lessons, but it made a huge. I mean, I'm a much better singer now than I was before having Bell's palsy. Cause I had never even once thought about the mechanics of, of singing. I just, you know, I just went out and did it cause I, you know, was on stage with a rock band and we had to, um, and that's how it was ever since I was a kid. So mm -hmm. I never stopped to think about it, but 
go, going through that process makes, I mean, it just thinking about how to project properly without killing your throat and all of that. Uh, my favorite lesson to do to, to, to budding singers is to have them stand across the room from me, maybe, you know, 20 feet away and tell me something, you know, say hello to me. And naturally they will project. They've already learned mm. how to do, you know, we all know how to do this, right. To project to somebody that's, that's far away. And it's like, okay, now instead of saying, hello, Dave, sing hello, Dave with this melody. And they will. And they're like, you know, it's gone. It's like, no, no, make it feel like it did when you mm. spoke to me. And that's how you're going to project. You're not going to try and do it from your throat. Let your air support you and, and do that. And, and it, you know, once you once you get used to doing that and you learn to do it all the time, not only do your muscles develop, but you just develop that habit of projecting and not killing yourself most of the time. Well, and, and I would say to kind of sum this all up, a, a good vocal teacher will give you tools that will let your body do things in a natural way, including yeah. keeping you on pitch. Right. So, yes, that you know, too. Right. Right. There's there's thinking about pitch and aiming for pitch and, you know, knowing you have to hit a certain note. But there's also like once you have your instrument tuned, your body kind of takes over and and uh, and to a large degree does the heavy lifting for you. It, it, so you can focus on the emoting, you know, which is really what it's all about. It does. Um, but I will tell you this. And I'm like my pit. My vocal tone is OK. My pitch is is rock solid. I mean, I'm not always right, but I'm. I know when I'm wrong and I, I, I can, I can usually find a, a note fairly easily. Uh, it's a skill I've developed the other night though, but it's not a guarantee. The other night <laughs> I was singing with Amanda. There are no guarantees. No, I was singing with Amanda and I, I don't know. I, I was just thinking about the mechanics of this right in the middle of singing these harmonies with her. And it was maybe like the third chorus of a tune or whatever it was. And it was like, Oh yeah. And I'm, I'm like in the middle and I'm, of course I'm playing and singing and but really what my focus is on is, oh, yeah, if I open up my throat this way, wow, it, you know, it's supported so much better. And suddenly I realized I am so far out of tune. <laughs> this is awful. So, I, of course, you know, I backed off, which is what I do whenever I'm out of tune. It's like, oh, nope. OK, I'll come back later. But I had I had lingered far longer than I ever do because I, I just am so hyper aware and, ho and hyper focused on pitch that if anything goes wrong with it. I, I bail out and, you know, yep. figure out what it was and come back later. Yeah. And, uh, and I did not do this. And I, you know, I looked at, she kind of looked at me at the end of the chorus, like, what was that? You know, <laughs> like, yeah, sorry. I get, got distracted, you know, and it's I one of the fun things about singing with uh, Mary Ellen and Steve, because they're, they're pretty much spot on and singing in a harmony group like that is a, you know, it is like going to a college class for me every day oh, because yeah. Yeah. I mean, and the thing is you can feel it. You can feel when your contribution to the overall vibration is dissonant or, you know, lined up yes. with what they're doing. It and that is it, a good harmony tastes good. And and th that's, you know, like you can just feel it. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So anyway, I would just want to encourage if you're a natural singer, uh, good for you. If you're not a natural singer <laughs> like, like me, uh, you know, I just want to say that there's a path, you know, and, and, and especially if you're a rock and roll singer, that's one of the, the great promises of rock and roll is that, you know, is that it's, it's, it, it doesn't require virtuosity in, in all ways that, you know, expression is a hard, large part about going over singing rock and roll, but pitch is, is uh, non-negotiable. Pitch is non-negotiable. I, that for me, that I, I know there will, there are people that will disagree with us. They're wrong, but they'll disagree with us. For me, I agree with you, man. Pitch is non-negotiable. Oh, God. But it, but it is, it is obtainable by everybody. The reason you're probably not in pitch is because you're probably fighting your instrument or you're not listening or you're not, you know, there's a, a number yeah. of reasons that you're not, but it is yeah. attainable for absolutely everybody. I guess unless I, you're literally deaf. Yeah. Well, I don't, I, I, there are some people that are tone deaf. I, I had this conversation with a, a college professor and this guy was like a savant. You could go, he loved to do this. He'd just say, go over to the piano and plunk down anywhere between one and 12 notes simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and he'd say, and he had, he didn't have perfect pitch. So he would, he would relative. say, yeah, he had killer relative pitch. So he would say, and I reserve the right to ask for the lowest note. 
Uh, he didn't always need it because his, you know, his relative pitch was really good and he was around music all the time. So he usually would knew kind of where he was, but, uh, but you know, you'd plunk down these, you know, whatever, 12 notes and he would just rattle through them and mm. tell you, Oh, yep. Here's all the notes you just played. But <laughs> I, I, and I asked him, you know, th- we had, we were having this conversation like, Hey man, you know, can everybody do this? And he said, no, uh, he's like, I've encountered people that are truly tone deaf. He said, it is a thing. I think Allison Sheridan, who is one of our techie friends in in our in our you know Mac slash Apple world, I the, she there is a gene that that she possesses that causes her to have zero emotional reaction to music, like mm. she just cannot connect with it in any way. And it's she's done a lot of research on this, and it's just a thing. Like you, you know, and and she told me the only time she's ever had an emotional reaction, she thought it was the most amazing thing. Was when we played Money for Nothing, we opened a Macworld All Star Band gig with it, and it wasn't that the music caused an emotional reaction. It was, you know, she was among her friends and all of this stuff, and suddenly here was this song that she recognized because we sort of played the intro in a spacey way, and then and then yeah. she, you know, and then we came in, she and she knew the song. And she's like, that must be what it's like for you all the time. I'm like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> yeah. But but there are people that 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 probably can't learn this. But hmm. by and large, I, I think you're right that, you know, it if you're if you've made it this far into this episode and you think you're a singer, you probably can learn pitch. Yeah, I, I, I feel like that's a safe that's a safe assumption. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Cool. Craziness. Good stuff. <sighs> well. That's all I got for today. How about you, man? Um, yeah, that's all for today. But we, we had this great email that came to us from you know someone who contributes to us quite a bit. That was a reaction to our our stage volume stuff. I think we got to give a lot of time to that next week. I, I I agree. We'll we'll yeah we'll we'll spend a little time talking about that next time. Yeah. Cool. All right, folks. Well, that's it. Visit us giggabpodcast.com. Add a slash Facebook to that if you want to join our uh, working musician support group. I like uh, it there. I do. I like it there. It's a good place. It's comfortable. Yeah. People good are people. Good. What, uh, what do we say? Always, always. Always be. Performing. <laughs>